Greetings. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, I think you can. Um, I'm going to go back to basic research, uh, and I think we haven't had that much of it today, but I'd like to point out that Lee, for um, many years and s many decades, was an absolutely fabulous pioneer in the basic research of immunology and genomics and their intersection. He inspired many people. Um, he basically laid out what we now see as a system-wide understanding of immunology. His pioneering work on the importance and the potential for um, evaluating things on the basis of whole genome sequence have been transformative. And I think that we don't necessarily give enough credit to him for the impact of these, of these major, major visionary accomplishments. Um, I am still working on implications of Lee's visionary accomplishments in this respect. And I want to also talk a little bit about his impact on gene network theory, uh, not so much in terms of correlation networks, but strictly in terms of causation networks. <clears throat> now, this comes back to the information coding problem of the genome. And I think there's been now widespread clinical utilization and diagnostic utilization of the protein coding aspect of the genome. But as Trey wonderfully already pointed out today, um, the genome is full of um, a lot more non-coding DNA than coding DNA, about a 50 to 1 ratio. And although we know some things that are in that non-coding DNA, we're actually pretty far behind in our understanding of that code. Uh, and this is really incredibly important because this is all the hardware of, uh, this is all the software of development, cell identity, and multicellularity. And the one place where I would deviate from what Trey talked about is I'm going to really emphasize um, aspects of the, the regulatory coding in the genome which are not addressable in yeast. Um, because they're properties that have evolved specifically to serve the needs of complex multicellular organisms, especially multicellular organisms with large genomes. Now, the software in the um, regulatory sequence code includes the conditions needed to express a gene, also the conditions, if you take one step back, that are needed to express the various regulators of a given gene. And so, if you actually zoom out, what this is essentially doing is struck is defining the structure of an entire gene network for defining cell type identities and also the, pro the developmental program that generates them from a single cell, which is the fertilized egg. Now, in the last 30 years, there's been enormous progress towards solving some of the mechanisms that decode genomic information and development. And I think Lee's impact has been considerable on this. Um, but in general, the field as a whole, really since the 80s and 90s, has um, defined roles of regulatory elements for gene expression, and you heard about this in terms of promoters and enhancers from Trey. There's a basic understanding of how it can work, and this actually is general across to uh, yeast. There's been a tremendous acceleration of this field due to genomic sequencing, um, and it's clear that there are um, simple individual molecular binding elements. There's real honest-to-God biophysics of protein DNA interaction underlying every single one of these higher order logic functions that I'm talking about today. Um, and yet, you need to actually aggregate them. There's emergent system property that comes from the combination of large numbers of these interactions. Now, the basic thing that everyone has to understand about multicellular organisms is that genes are not regulated by single transcription factors. They're regulated by the binding of combinations of protein transcription factors to regulatory sites that we call enhancers or cis-regulatory elements. And um, these elements can be near the promoter, but more often there are quite a few of them and they're scattered around upstream, downstream, and in introns of the genes. Um, the point is that the same uh, transcription factors can work in a number of different contexts where they contribute to the control of expression of genes which actually may not be expressed in the same cell type. So, for example, if you have two cell types which express the light blue and the dark blue transcription factor, both of them, but some of them express the pink transcription factor and some of them express the yellow and green but not the pink, you're going to see gene A expressed in both cell types, but gene B will be only in one cell type. And gene 
and see only in the other. If you knock out the light blue transcription factor, you may lose expression of all three, but that doesn't make them all regulated the same way. So the logic is combinatorial, and this is actually how we can manage to live with a finite number of genes. Now, the architecture of the DNA sequence in these cis-regulatory elements specifies a unique 3D geometry of the protein DNA complexes. This is um, a picture from some work that Steve Harrison did on the um, very, very tiny compact enhancer for the interferon beta gene. Um, but you can see that it, the orientation of the DNA sequence forces um, this part of NF-kappa B here to be pointing in the same side of the DNA double helix as this part of the June ATF2 complex. This creates a particular hollow on this side. It's not randomly twisting around, and so you, you basically establish the potential for a defined structure. Um, this has been called an enhancesome. Other enhancers can be more dispersed, but it's clear that the uh, organization is set by the DNA sequence, which tells these sequence-specific transcription factors where they can and cannot bind. So. Um, Cellular identity is going to be defined by the genes that a cell expresses, which means that it's defined by the transcription factors that are needed to enable the cell to express those genes and not to express the wrong genes. How do you get to this point? Well, you need to have transcription factors that, in, that control the expression of these transcription factors, okay? So we actually are now getting a developmental process, and the, the difference between one cell type and its closest relative essentially um, cr traces you back to the multipotent precursor, which now gives, has the competence to express this set of transcription factors, is induced to express these, which then control these, and now allow you to get your cell out at the end. Now, transcription factors are really important. I think uh, people have known about them for a long time, and so a lot of the buzz in the field is about everything but transcription factors. But they remain the major regulators of gene expression. And the, the impacts of transcription factors in changing gene expression, for example, in reprogramming cells to iPS cells, is beyond dispute. The fact that they work combinatorially is a crucial part of the way they work. It is not a limitation of their role. And the main point is it's because they have specific DNA binding specificity that they allow the DNA not only to encode the proteins, but also to encode the regulatory code for when those proteins should be expressed. Um, furthermore, it's clear that these things do work in cascades as I sort of showed by that arrow diagram, this, for example, is a diagram of the very, uh, a very tiny part of the gene network that starts to specify dorsal ventral polarity in a fruit fly embryo. And you start with a signal-dependent transcription factor that can activate the gene coding for another transcription factor. This combination can now turn on genes which would not otherwise be able to be expressed by one or the other. The combination can turn on these genes. It can also turn on these genes, which um, may encode a negative regulator that then may limit the expression of a third class of genes and so forth. And this by what I've just drawn here, you actually specify three stripes head to tail of gene expression across the body of, of a fly, and this is what happens dynamically in real time over you know, a period of less than an hour. Now, um, gene network theory, as I've exemplified there, has been beautifully uh, established for early embryonic development. And this has really been a triumph of the last 15 years. The, the theoretical foundations really go back to the late 1960s, but there was no way to do the experiments in those days. Um, it's clear that the molecular biology is translating logic inputs into actual biophysical measurable interactions, DNA protein uh, interactions. The fact that there were these excellent experimental systems made it possible to do experimental validation. Without the validation, there would be no gene network science. There would be gene network fantasy. But the science comes from the fact that these are excellent, perturbable, accessible embryological systems where you can prove that changing the availability of a transcription factor or changing the sequence at its target site produce specific gene-specific effects. And so this has now been very beautifully um, 
uh, validated. The point is that Lee made a huge contribution to this in the most ambitious version of gene network theory for development by essentially uh, taking the genomic viewpoint to challenge uh, his colleague and friend Eric Davidson um, to push to whole organism scope in terms of a predictive model. Uh, and actually, this, this became a great success. Um, and this is one of the le later iterations of it just before Eric's death um, a, a few years ago, in which essentially all of the regulatory interactions that control expression of transcription factor and signaling genes from the single from the single fertilized egg down to the point where you actually have seven or so different tissue types established in the embryo. Everyone is, is accounted for here. And this, is, this works from the bottom up. If you go to any one of these individual genes where you see these little symbols, that's where you know the exact DNA sequence that that transcription factor uh, defined by an arrow impinges upon um, in order to carry out it's part of the role in expressing this. So the point is that you can, ex you can explain development of complexity from simplicity um, through understanding a gene regulatory network by uh, the, avail the initial state, which is quite limited in complexity, and then knowing the genomic code that actually controls the expression of genes that will be important for the evolving diversification of the cells. So this is the triumph, really, of the last couple of years, the last couple of years, the last 15 years. Um, the point of this talk, though, is what we don't know and what lies ahead. And I think that one of the sorrows that I have is that um, many people have sort of forgotten that there's anything that we don't know about this. But there's a lot that we don't know. And I would argue that the major um, predictive gold is yet to be mined in this system. Remember, I said um, transcription factors are agents of developmental causality, et cetera, et cetera. But what, if you actually look at the way a transcription factor binds to the genome and associate that with um, the activity of the genes in the vicinity of those binding events, you find quite a bit of complications here. First, the binding can be conditional uh, based on collaborating factors, importantly, uh, depending on the role of chromatin configuration to restrict access. That's a very, very big point, and it's really where I would argue um, the developmental memory of a cell resides, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, the very important problem with relating uh, protein DNA binding to protein DNA regulatory function is that most observed binding appears to be non-functional if you look across the genome. And I think anyone who's done chip seek for a factor that you actually can do perturbations on knows that it can be upwards of 90% of the binding sites are not visibly linked to any gene that responds to either the gain or loss of function of that transcription factor. Um, Finally, the epigenetic state reflects the cell history, but we don't, there are things, that, really important things that we don't know about the kinetics or the mechanisms involved in changing the epigenetic state from accessible to inaccessible. And I, this is what, really what I want to talk about uh, for the, the rest of the talk. Now, one thing is we cannot, because of these problems, read the genomic code predictively. And I would argue that this is a huge challenge um, for the future if people have the stomach and the uh, the rigor, the logical rigor to be willing to take it on. Um, at first, we don't know, I, I think that this is, uh, this is basically a bioinformatic issue, but I think the key points are what makes the difference between transcription factor binding and transcription factor effector regulatory function. And second, if you have a gene that has 12 potential regulatory elements. What's the syntax that regulates the impacts of the transcription factors at these different sites? What determines which elements will be dominant? The pictures you see in textbooks give you a, a very pat view of this, um, but it's usually completely based on you know, decades of work that people did on a few small regions, not based on what you see when you just look at transcription factor binding across the genome. So function and binding. I think part of the answer to the question, but something we have to take into consideration, is that there are multiple levels at which a transcription factor can play a role in the activation of a gene. Um, or the transition of its gene between active and inactive. 
And I think uh, Ken Zarat at UPenn has done a great service for the community in distinguishing between um, acting transcription factors and pioneer transcription factors. The point of a pioneer is it's a transcription factor that can see its site even when the chromatin is closed. Um, and which can at least establish a beachhead. Now this may be days or weeks or whatever before the, before the gene actually goes on, but it's necessary, though not, perhaps not sufficient, for the gene to go on later. How many of these silent binding events are actually pioneering events? We don't know yet, but that's a key question. Uh, the binding of this may result in no change in the openness of the chromatin at the moment, but other factors may now bind that wouldn't have bound before now that they have a protein-protein interaction as well as a protein-DNA interaction. And this may, may be enough to start modifying the histones in the region and also to open up DNA accessibility in this region, which is a symptom of pushing the nucleosomes aside so that other factors can get at the chromatin. This may still not be enough to activate the gene. So if you're looking at your RNA-seq measurement, you may still not see this as a positive event for the gene, but this may be the necessary precondition for getting yet another tier of factors recruited, which may then be the ones that actually establish the connection with the promoter. So in this case, if you look at which is the proximal cause of the gene going on, you would say, uh, transcription factors that pink, but the one that started it all might be this dark blue one. And I, it's just very important to realize that we don't, we still don't have diagnostics for these earlier events, and we don't know how reversible they are, uh, and therefore we can't score all of these effects. Now. One example of this, um, in a gene which is incredibly important in the system that I work on, which is early T-cell development, there's a, there's a gene that codes for a transcription factor called BCL11B, which is essential to, to lock down and establish the identity of T-cells. We know quite a lot about this gene because it's clearly worth learning about because it's turning on is the boundary between multipotency and T cell commitment. So what turns it on? And it's a beautiful example of this because it actually has, here's a gene, that's, here's its distal regulatory element that I'll show you some more data about in just a moment. Um, we know that there are at least four transcription factors that, ha that are needed to turn it on. GATA3, TCF, NOTCH, and RUNCs. Um, but they don't work by all co-assembling, like at that interferon beta enhancesome. In fact, there's an early specific effect for which GATA and TCF are absolutely required long before the gene goes on, days before the gene goes on, but they presumably establish a beachhead here, which now allows the genome to start removing repressive chromatin from this region. And Irv Weissman, um, a few years back with Andrew Feinberg's lab, uh, did a genome-wide scan of the DNA methylation, and actually this gene is covered with closed methylation up until this point, and this is when the methylation starts to come off. It's only after this, the gene still is not on. It's still not on, but now at this point, an additional signal, a more notch signal, uh, now allows runks to go here. At this point, if you take the cells right here, they don't care about GATA3 and TCF anymore. They've already done their job. They were essential back here. They're not essential anymore down here. Runks and Notch still are. But this gives you a picture of how these different, you can have actually coupling over time between different regulatory inputs as part of the need to get a gene on correctly. Okay, syntax between regulatory regions. Let me use the same gene as an example of why this is a problem. Um, you can have, you know, we are complex organisms. We do not have multiples of the number of genes that little roundworms, C. elegans, have. We have the same number of genes. But we make what we would argue, at least, uh, to be more complex structures um, because we are willing to use the same genes in different combinations in different tissues. How does this work? This works because we have multiple regulatory elements for each of these genes, which controls their correct expression in the right place and time. And even these cell type specific master regulators are often used in unrelated places. So EBF1 is crucial for making B cells. It's also crucial for making fat cells and olfactory cells. BCL11B also makes teeth. It certainly doesn't 
doesn't make tooth enamel in your T cells, but it is needed to make teeth. Um, so how does this work? And I think uh, David Kingsley gave a beautiful example of this when he studied the role of the PIDX1 gene in hind limb um, development in uh, stickleback fish, and this is actually in the textbook, and he basically defined multiple spe tissue-specific enhancers for this gene and found that one particular one was the site of polymorphisms in certain stickleback fish clades, which prevented them from making a hind fin, and it basically was because it wiped out the expression of this gene in that domain without, of course, touching its role in other tissues. But this, is, this makes it look very neat and clean, where each regulatory element has a little label on it, which is dedicated. And in fact, um, when we actually look from a transcription factor's point of view, not after decades of David Kingsley's lab's work on the PIDX1 gene, but genome-wide, uh, what we see is that um, you know, we know what these cell type specific enhancers are after people have isolated those elements and really beat on them by showing that they can drive tissue specific expression, um, sort of the way we were just hearing about. But in the context of the whole intact gene, one of these elements, um, which may be sufficient, may not, may not absolutely be necessary. There is redundancy. You often see weak, limited effects of deletions of individual elements. The question is, are they additive um, in their activity? Sometimes they have, um, they have roles in a specific state, but not another state. Um, also, as we now understand more about the biochemistry of gene expression, we realize that there are, there's transcriptional bursting phenomenon uh, where the RNA polymerases can make a whole series of initiations on a gene and then pause in between. Um, and this, can, this means that the question of what is an enhancer actually doing, is it, is it starting a burst? Or is it loading one polymerase? Or is it opening chromatin for other things to take over? We really don't know how to recognize the difference between those effects. And I think this whole system has become vastly more complex as we appreciate more the scope of the problem through genome-wide chromatin interaction measurements. I think this hasn't simplified things. This has basically given us a better sense of the dimensions of the problem. Here's just a little tiny example, again, with our, my favorite BCL11B gene. Here is the um, distal enhancer 850,000 base pairs away from the gene. Um, and and uh, this is, these are loops that are formed as you go from hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells through multipotent precursors through the early stages of T cell development before the BCL11B gene comes on. And then this is where the BCL11B gene comes on and stays on forever afterwards. And um, what you can see is there's an increased frequency of loops from the BCL11B locus um, to this region in here. Um, so this is, but you can see also, this is 850 kilobases. There's an awful lot of other loops in here. And as the cells go on, there are many, many loops in this region. Um, but even if you just focus on the ones including BCL11B, you've got basically a megabase of loops to consider. Now, we've looked at this region right here because, in fact, in terms of chromatin marks and in terms of transcription factor binding sites, this is the obvious hot spot for the initiation of expression of this gene. Um, it's a beautiful peak. We call it major peak because it sort of sticks up there, and it's, it's got all of the beautiful histone marks for being a major enhancer. Um, it has binding sites for all the transcription factors I showed you before. So we've gone in and we've deleted it, and we decided that in, to see what effect this would have on gene expression, and to, ask, to really test what it's doing, we decided to do it with an internal control in which we tagged one allele of BCL11B with red, that's the control uh, allele, and we tagged the other allele with yellow fluorescent protein, and this is the one that we mutated, and, uh, and asked um, what happens to the correlation between red and yellow expression in the same cell. This is an interesting experiment, both because of what it tells us about this particular enhancer element's role, and because of what it tells us about the role of enhancers in general. And I think that has very broad implications for human um, GWAS studies as well. And this is the only data, actual data, I want to show you, but I think it's a pretty obvious result. In the control, you're looking at red versus yellow. And 
So red is always the control. This is telling you whether the cell has matured to the point where it's turned on BCL11, be it all not or not. And these cells have not, these cells all have, um, these cells are in the process. And the question is, do they turn on red and yellow? Or did they turn on one and not the other, or, or the other and not the one? And you can see that in the wild type, they turn on the red and the yellow symmetrically. And by the time you get to this stage, both of them are expressed in 100%, almost 100% of the cells, not all. Um, however, if you mutate that little two kilobase element from the enhancer, well, the bad news is most of the cells, two thirds of the cells still turn on the yellow allele. Um, and only some of them don't. But um, if you look at the order in which they turn them on now, it is 100% the red allele first. This one is always late. It's the, the yellow one is always late now with this deletion. It will catch up, but it won't catch up completely. And I can tell you that the mature T cells continue to have a subset out there that fail to express the second allele, which means that the resulting population is mosaic. And I think it's very interesting because if you just looked at the total amount of BCL11 RNA in this population, you'd say it's within measurement error of wild type. But if you actually look at the individual cell level, these guys are only expressing a half a dose. And um, they may, if this were a tumor suppressor, that might be an issue. So this is one example of how we know that this is not necessary but for everything, but it is playing a developmentally restricted role. Now, the final point I want to make is uh, we can't tell why development is one way. And I think this is really an important point. We can override it by dumping in large groups of transcription factors as we do in reprogramming, but we can't actually make it go backwards. What's the barrier? And this doesn't quite make sense because, you know, all of the individual component reactions biochemically should be reversible. They aren't, so one possibility, so development is vectorial. And so say this is a stem cell that's giving rise to wildly different cell types, this one's spinning off another. Say you wanna to get to this cell here. Well, we can only get this cell to go back to its precursor state um, by making it go all the way back to being an iPS cell and then differentiating it back out again. Um, we don't know how to do this, so why not? And it's, again, you know, at the organismal level, uh, I think Eric Davidson used to talk about how embryogenesis gave you irreversibility through an increase in complexity. It's a sort of an entropy argument. Um, but at the individual cell level, there's not an increase in complexity. There's just an accumulation of epigenetic history. Transcription factor binding itself is extremely dynamic, mostly with extremely fast off rates. So, um, and many of the gene network states that you score in embryos are in fact transient. So how does a T cell that's migrating around the body for a large part of your lifetime remember that it's a T cell through multiple different domains of the body, multiple rounds of activation, cell cycling, resting, and so forth. And we have to think about this probably as being encoded in the epigenetic marks. And now there's been a lot of excitement, especially in the ENCODE project uh, that has already been uh, wonderfully mentioned about um, positively acting epigenetic marks. We can tell the difference between a gene that's off and the stages of a gene being turned on, which I just was sort of diagramming for you earlier. Um, and we can also define, especially in ES and IPS cells, a poised bivalent state in which a gene that's sort of partway active gets um, temporarily shut down by an imposition of a repressive mark, which is then reversible. You know, it's poised for reactivation. But what we can't tell is why a gene that's off in a cell type um, never goes on again, never, despite the sharing of transcription factors that are used in one tissue and another, the genes from the wrong tissue don't get turned on in the other. And what I would argue is that we're lacking understanding specifically of depths of repression. We don't understand the difference between neutrality and silencing, profound silencing. This is quite as addressable with current technology, but it hasn't been recognized as such an important issue. 
and a gene that's off permanently can never be turned on again. So what are the possibilities? I think it's unlikely to be maintained only by transacting factors. The whole point about transcription factors is that they're meant to be working in different combinations in a dynamic way. Um, is it tight histone packing? Okay. If so, how, why? What's the difference between this tight histone packing and just something that isn't currently active? We don't have a marker yet. Um, long non-coding RNAs, there's a lot of interest in this. They seem to work in cis. Some may lock down positive regulation, some negative regulation. There's also a possibility that there's an in intranuclear relocalization. There's a nuclear lamina associated repressive compartment. Um, no one knows anything at all about how this localization is controlled, triggered, maintained. This is obviously waiting to be studied and understood. And um, I think the point is, what are the gene-specific points of control for these? So my argument is that I think that while we've blown quickly through the first generation of post-genomic research, we've missed perhaps the most rewarding information science aspect of the genome, which is how process is encoded in the genome, not just structure. And I think that this is an, an emergent uh, structure of a process, as it were. I think it depends on um, a full understanding, a much more complete hierarchy of chromatin states, speaking of hierarchy, um, in order to fully account for what we know biological systems do. Um, we need this in order to do precision cell engineering. We can't do precision cell engineering if we can't control um, the activation of a gene in that particular cell. And we and we have to be able to regulate genes in the chromatid context, not simply by transfecting in a stripped down little reporter construct. And finally, I believe that there's an extremely important intellectual and broader um, reward from this. This is the old code. This is the real information code in our, in, in, in life, and we barely understand it. And it seems to me that many of the uh, softwares that we design now are not based on a complete understanding of what works and what has been forged through the selective fires of evolution. And so I think it, we would do well to actually uh, realize that this is an incredibly rich problem, uh, and we should basically understand how you can combine robustness, tunability, and evolvability, which is what this very complicated and still poorly understood code has enabled us to do. So thank you very much.